So today we celebrate not only our KDE4 release, technical innovation, technical excellence, but we're also celebrating the next generation of the Unix desktop. We're celebrating new stuff, but we're celebrating, most of all, contributors, people, the people to, together make up the KDE community. So that's what we're here for. Let's party. 11 years ago, an international team of technologists, artists, translators, documenters, and communicators started to assemble. Today we form the heart of a global community that is thousands strong. We have worked together across all divides, human and technical, to create software for all manners of people, devices, and systems. And in that time, we've accomplished what few thought was possible. We've created a coherent and innovative user experience erected entirely in the open using a process based on participation. Some of us that participate are entrepreneurs, others are researchers or professionals in our respective fields. But we're all technology enthusiasts and together we make KDE. And to celebrate the launch of 4.0, I'd like to share with you what it means to be KDE. It all starts with freedom. So as you know, KDE is a free software project, as in freedom software. And our core values suggest that we should all be free to do various things. And we express that in our software. In particular, we believe that you should be free to own your own data. You should be able to choose your vendors. And you should be able to explore, create, and learn without artificial external restrictions upon that. I hear someone clapping. At the same time, it's not all serious as well. You think that everyone should be free to have fun while they're using technology. They should be able to get the work they need to get done, done. And most importantly, we should all be able to connect with others just like us through technology. So when we started KDE4, designing it and thinking, what are we going to do with it? There were three primary principles that we kept returning to over and over and over again in our discussions and our conversation. There's my, you can barely see it. First one was beauty. We wanted to make a system that was pretty and beautiful at all levels. We wanted to make something that people would, would be proud to show their friends, that they would congregate around when it booted up on a laptop screen. We wanted something that would stand next to our proprietary competitors' offerings of recent years, and people would go, oh, I want that one. I want the KDE one. That's a pretty high bar, but we set it for ourselves, and we, we said we wanted something just drop-dead gorgeous. We also wanted to make something that was accessible to everyone. Now, that means people speaking different languages should be in their own language. Obviously, for years, we've delivered um, a highly internationalized and localized system. KD35, for instance, uh, is available in over 60 languages. So with 4.0, we're continuing that tradition. But we also wanted to extend our reach to people with physical disabilities. So we've uh, put accessible, uh, accessibility as a, as a prime goal in KD4.0, and we achieved that. But we also wanted to allow people that traditionally didn't get to use our software, we wanted to give them access to our software as well. I'm going to talk about that uh, near the end, actually. We've got some pretty exciting stuff there. And finally, of course, we wanted something that was highly functional. We wanted something that had lots of features, allowed people to do things in new ways, uh, and accomplish well their work and have fun while they're doing it. So we kept coming back to these three principles of form, function, and availability. While we were designing things, we found that we kept thinking about these three things as well, parity, performance, and promise. Now, what I mean by parity is people have come to expect a certain level of functionality from their computers. They expect to be able to go online and view YouTube. They expect to be able to share their calendars with their friends. They expect to be able to play videos and audio. They expect to have, be able to you know, have a solitaire game. There are expectations that people have from computing. It's part of our, of our culture now, um, having uh, personal computers around for a few decades. So we realized we had to at least meet those, those expectations. Uh, and that was really the departure of KD4, was we sat back, we realized that with KD3, we had largely met those expectations. You could share your calendars, you could go online and do your web apps, uh, you could play games, you could do content creation. So for 4, we realized we had to add to that, that level of parity, and we had to do new things. We had to do 
things you could do now, but offer them to you in better ways, in new ways. And that was really our focus on the performance. But we weren't just looking at 4.0. In fact, at the end of my presentation, the last uh, half hour or so of the presentation, we're actually going to look at the roadmap for KDE 4. Because 4.0 is just the beginning. Right? We've arrived at the starting line, so to speak. And KDE 4 is going to have releases that go on for years. So we couldn't just think about 4.0. We had to think about, what is this desktop going to be in 10 years? That can be difficult to do when it comes to technology, because technology, of course, tends to be fairly unpredictable. But as technology creators, we have no choice but to actually think about these things. So when we were designing our software for KDE 4, we had to think about, what are we going to do in the future? What promise can we hold out for ourselves and for our users in the way we design our software? So as we take a look at KDE 4, we're going to see these principles time and again, these principles based on freedom. And we're going to see the parity, the performance, and the promise of KDE 4. Now, KDE itself, and for the non-technical in the, in the audience, I'm sure there's a few of you, don't get too scared. This is the only uh, block diagram I have. <clears throat> so how does KDE get put together? Right? We talked about the community right at the beginning. We're an international team, but the technology, how does that get put together? Well, KDE itself layers on top of the operating system. Whoops. Layers on top of the operating system. We use a lot of system frameworks. Uh, an example of that is DBus. In KDE 4, we adopted the uh, DBus Interprocess Communication Protocol. It's something that, as a user, you'll never see, probably, but it's what allows our applications to work together and talk to each other um, in the background. Uh, we try to avoid recreating wheels that already exist. If something exists and it works well, we, we try and, uh, and use that. So we rely very heavily on a lot of the frameworks that come with the operating system. One of the keys that starts to set KDE apart from every other desktop operating system available is Qt. The Qt library uh, is put out by a company called Trolltech. And that is one of our fundamental libraries that we, we build upon to create the KDE experience. Qt itself sits, straddles kind of halfway in between the frameworks and the KDE platform. And we'll actually see where some of that, that bridging happens as we go through the platform. Now, we're not going to talk too much about the frameworks, the operating system, or even Qt itself. Um, this afternoon, uh, we have uh, one of the chief executives from Trolltech that will be here to talk about that. So I'll let him do that. He'll do a better job than I could. What we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the KDE platform itself. This is, these are the tools and the technologies that we give application developers so they can make really great software. Our applications themselves, and of course this is what the user cares about, right? It's like, okay, frameworks, libraries, yeah, 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 get to the good stuff. Well, we divide our applications into three pieces. Workspace, and the workspace is what you would come to expect from a desktop. The Windows Explorer shell, uh, the Mac OS X Finder. We have a, an equivalent, of course, for that called the workspace that we uh, deliver on Unix and Linux platforms. But in addition to that, we have core applications. And we're going to be taking a look at some of those core applications. And these are applications that we provide alongside of our development platform whenever we do a release. And next to our core applications, we have suites of applications. We have an application suite for education. We have a suite of uh, desktop games and amusements. We have an office productivity suite, K-Office. Um, we have a, a personal information management suite. Um, many of you will be familiar with Contact, our groupware solution. So we're going to take a look at the KDE platform and then each of these three groups of software. When we started to look at what we wanted to do to the guts, of our technologies, our libraries, our frameworks, we started to notice that there were these supporting frameworks that were starting to emerge. And we thought, well, they're supporting frameworks. They're kind of like pillars, aren't they? And so in the community, we started to refer to them as the pillars of KDE 4. And these are the, the supports that hold up the entire system. Obviously, we have the core libraries. And these really are. Uh, retouch-ups of what we've been delivering for the last seven years in KDE 2 and KDE 3. Uh, these are things such as our component system, K-Parts. 
um, our configuration system, kconfig. These all originated in either 2.0 or 3.0, and what we've done in 4.0 is we've taken them really to the next, the next level. So for instance, our configuration system now supports multiple backends so that we can do things such as allow configuration to be drawn from, say, directory services. But in addition to the core libraries that we've known for years, we've brought a lot more to the table. We talked about beauty uh, in, in one of the earlier slides. Oxygen was a project that was started a few years ago. We had a meeting in uh, Berlin, Germany called the Appeal Project Meeting, where we kind of got together and, and, and decided, we tried to come up with some ideas of what we wanted to do. Um, and we invited artists, usability experts, developers, and even business management people. So we had a really interesting cross-section. Uh, and this is quite uh, new for us, and I, I don't think a lot of free software projects take that holistic approach to developing software. And it really paid off because the artists could see what we were doing, and they embodied our, pro our principles um, and our uh, means of working and made it their own. And they formed a project called Oxygen. Why Oxygen? Well, it was kind of a joke at the time. We said we wanted to bring a breath of fresh air to the desktop. So they called it Oxygen. Oxygen started out as a new set of icons. Pretty simple sounding, until we realized that our desktop ships with well over a thousand icons. This is not a small art project. Essentially, they're painting on a canvas this big, making thousands of pictures. We looked at what we did in previous releases, KD2, KD1, KD3, and we thought we could do this a lot better. So the artists teamed up with the usability experts that were there at this meeting and in subsequent months and discussed how we're actually going to approach delivering the artwork. So in KD4 uh, applications, you'll, if you look closely, you'll notice that there's some really interesting uh, little touches. In the, in, back in the Elizabethan era, paintings were often framed in these gaudy, huge frames. The frames themselves were hand-tooled, full of gold gilt. They were art, pieces of artwork in and of themselves. Beautiful frames, don't get me wrong. The problem with it is you couldn't really pay attention to the painting because the frame overpowered the content. After that period, there was a movement to, towards extremely simple frames. Frames that looked nice, that complemented the picture, but stayed out of the way. So with KD4, we decided we should do the same thing. So the icons that we use in our toolbars, in our menus, they use a desaturated color palette. They're simplified. They're stay out of the way. They frame the content of the application, give you access to the features you need without actually interfering with the content. The content itself, however, again through the Oxygen project, has been made more vibrant than ever. Than ever. We'll be looking at some of the, uh, the applications in the demos in a minute, and you'll probably see a lot of the, uh, the nice icons in the file manager, for instance, that really stand out and, and breathe. But once we had nice icons, we started thinking about that, everything else started to look not so good in comparison. So they said, well, where can we go from here? Well, how about we redesign how the windows look? How about we design how the widgets look? Why don't we do a cursor theme? Yeah, that'd be good. How about we do sounds? Yeah, that'd be good too. So we re-imaged the entire desktop from widgets to icons to our sounds, and it all comes in this form of oxygen. So some of the really nice touches that you'll see, you may notice, is the title bar, for instance, and the content of the window blend nicely together. There's a, a nice subtle gradient that holds it together. If you run a non-KD4 application, like an older KD3 application or, uh, say, Firefox or whatnot, you'll actually start to notice a difference. Um, these little hints that you don't, may not notice immediately, but when you compare it to what we used to deliver, it's really apparent. But of course, beauty, they say, is only skin deep. And that's true. You have to provide a lot more substance than just beauty. And that's where these next set of frameworks come in. One of the things that we identified was it's kind of silly that computers, with all this horsepower and all this ability to plug in devices and whatnot, I can plug in my USB camera, I can go on a Wi-Fi network, and I can go to the next room and go into another Wi-Fi network. I mean, this was space age stuff, right, 20 years ago. It's common today, and yet our software has really not been updated to take advantage of these things. So how many people here have uh, gone offline only to have their instant messenger pop up every five minutes saying, I can't connect to the, uh, to the online service? Why? 
Why doesn't it know about these things? Well, it turns out that, especially doing cross-platform, hardware detection is non-trivial. And someone doing an instant messaging application may not actually be an expert in how to talk to the operating system kernel or how, uh, if you're on Linux. Um, and if you don't run a BSD and a Solaris box and a Windows box and a Mac, you don't know what they provide. You have no way of testing. So we wrapped up a framework called Solid. It's about hardware. It gives us easy access to hardware events. So when I plug a device in, an application get an event. You can query how many core CPU cores do we have, uh, how much memory do I have, what does my system, setting, uh, system configuration look like. Am I on the network? Let me know when new networks uh, become available. What's my power management situation? Now, the beautiful thing about this is we provide a simple, clear, concise, and coherent API so that any application developer, even if you're not an expert with hardware, can provide these kind of features. And we're starting to see these features pop up in KD4 applications, and it creates a better user experience. But even more importantly, as the operating system evolves underneath us, as you all know, Linux never changes. As the operating system underneath us changes over time, or even if we take our applications to new platforms, we don't have to rewrite this code. Because Solid takes care of all the abstraction away uh, from the application developer's mind and puts it right within this framework. So you just say, let me know when I'm on the network. And it will work regardless of what operating system you're on and if you are compiling this program five years from now. Another sore spot we noticed was multimedia. Multimedia in the free software world has been sketchy. And it's not because we don't have good multimedia support. We've actually licked that one a few years ago. We've got a number of really good systems, whether it's Zine or the M Player or GStreamer or whatnot. But we weren't seeing it in applications, and for the same reason as, hardware pro as a hardware issue. It's too hard. The people writing the multimedia frameworks kind of expected us all to be multimedia experts. So if I was writing a note-taking utility and I wanted to record a little bit of audio or let the user record a little bit of audio along with their notes, I had to become a multimedia expert. So we didn't see a lot of multimedia. And now doing cross-platform multimedia was even more difficult. A lot of applications we delivered in the past would work, multimedia applications would work on only certain platforms. And we decided that was no longer acceptable. Phonon came in to fill that gap. Phonon does for multimedia what Solid does for hardware. It gives developers a future-proof, cross-platform, clear and consistent way to add multimedia features very quickly to your application. How quickly? In around five lines of code, you can have an entire video player with seek and volume controls in your application. This is going to bring multimedia to the free software world. Now, remember Solid. With Solid, we can ask, do I have a webcam? Where is it? Give it to me. With Phonon, we'll be able to capture video. In uh, 4.0, it does playback only. The, the capture was, uh, was pulled out. We wanted to redesign it. It's coming in 4.1, uh, KD 4.1, that is. But these frameworks are going to bring together new ways, uh, new, new opportunities for developers. So we can actually say, where's your webcam? Let me capture it. Let me output it to this mic and whatnot. Things that were black magic um, in the past in free software. VoIP and presence for instant messaging is an increasingly large part of people's day-to-day -day use of their computers. So again, we decided we need to fill that hole too. And we uh, created Decibel. Uh, Decibel, uh, which is still in development but had a release uh, just recently, is a KDE 4 framework that builds upon the freedesktop.org uh, work that being done uh, with uh, Tapioca. And it provides the same kind of API that Solid and Phonon do, but for instant messaging and for presence. So we'll start to see, I think, uh, a lot more pervasive use of, of messaging with Decibel. Akinati, I just love that graph because it looks so impressive. <clears throat> um, Akinati, what is Akinati? Well, this is going to sound a little bit repetitive because you're going to hear this message over and over and over again. We decided that people should be able to access their calendaring and their mail and their contacts a lot easier than they could now. They should also be able to, with the performance side of it, 
They should be able to store as much mail and as many contacts as they want. They should be able to get them on LDAP or local stores. And the application shouldn't have to worry about it. It should just simply say, give me a contact. And all the applications should be able to work together, so you wouldn't have to worry about synchronization issues. So the very smart people in our PIM group, the Personal Information Management group, took a step back, did a very brave thing, and said, let's not start with the GUI. Let's start with the storage and retrieval system. And that's what Akhenati is. Akhenati is a unified, uh, non-graphical access framework for all data related to contacts, calendaring, um, and mail. This is going to allow us, and already has allowed us actually, to expose this information in places we never could before. We're going to see Pla the Plasma desktop in a bit, and one of the things that, that the Akhenati people did was in just a, a few hundred lines of code, we're able to bridge Akhenati to the desktop so you could start seeing your contacts and your mail scroll past in real time as it happened. And this is in sync, of course, with your full groupware application. Cross. Many of us feel that one of the great untapped reservoirs of, of, uh, of talent out there are users who are advanced enough to be able to write in scripting languages, say ECMAScript or JavaScript, Ruby, Python. We made it very difficult for them to do this in many of our applications. Amarok, which is, one, which is our, uh, our premier multimedia application, they provide the ability for people to add new functionality using Ruby scripts, scripts written in Ruby. And an amazing thing happened. All of a sudden, this little piece of software could do all kinds of things, like fetch lyrics, get information from Wikipedia, do crazy playlist uh, manipulation. And we looked at that one. That's a really good idea. Now, the K-Office people working on our Office documents wanted to provide scripting support, of course. Perhaps not Visual Basic. We wanted something a little bit better. And of course, the, the, the discussion came up of which language. And uh, for those of you who, who know a few programming geeks, you may know that that's a, uh, a flame war starter right there. Yeah, the people, the Pythonistas and the Rubyists, and, the, you know, and then people like me saying, no, we need to keep it simple. Let's go with ECMAScript. Cross allows us to very simply add scripting support to any Qt4 based application. And what's really cool about it is you can write these scripts in the language of your choice. We don't make this decision for you. You're free to choose which, which uh, scripting language you want to standardize on. So if you're a company and internally you use Python for a lot of your stuff, I understand there's a company near here that does that. Maybe you want to use Python to be able to automate and control your desktop. Maybe you want to use Python in your office documents. And Cross allows us to do that. As an application developer, Cross makes it absolutely trivial. Again, five or six lines of code, and you can actually ex uh, export objects from your application into the runtime of the script and allow the user to manipulate it. Sonnet is a word checker, spell checker, and eventually it'll hopefully have grammar checking as well. They're working on that. And what's really neat about Sonnet is it has the ability to uh, auto-detect the language. And it's multi-language from the beginning. This may not mean so much to those of us in North America where we converse pretty much daily in, in English and only English, but for those of us who uh, do business internationally or live, interna live outside of North America, it's very common to have one document in German, another document in English, a third one in French, or sometimes all three languages in the same document. Spell checking can be a real pain in these situations. Well, Sonnet allows us to say, in this paragraph, I want it spell checked in German. This paragraph, I want it spell checked in Hebrew, whatnot. And it does this without any configuration on the user's uh, part. This is what happens when you give people the ability, the freedom to tinker and toy and try new things. This is what happens when you're an international project and they're not you know, some afterthought market over there in Africa or Asia or whatnot. It's, they are our prime audience. And you get these, these, this level of internationalization that you just don't see elsewhere. DXS. Some of you may have known this as GHNS. We love our acronyms. Get Hot New Stuff. It's a way to get updates over the internet with just point and click. One of the things that we looked at was how difficult we make it as technologists for end users 
to use this beautiful thing called the internet. Because the internet, you can get all kinds of stuff on the internet, right? But it's interesting. Ask someone to change their wallpaper. Go get a new wallpaper. So they fire up their web browser and they go to, you know, digitalwallpapers.com or whatnot. They download one that's sitting there on their desktop and they, oh, okay, how do I do it? Maybe I'll drag it to my desktop. And we make them go through all these steps. Well, DXS is the next version of, of GitHub New Stuff. It's a web service that allows us to put directly into our applications the ability to grab new data over the internet. Oops. There we are. So this is KSTARS. And I've got a whole bunch of data uh, in here. And I actually just downloaded it while I was setting up. This is I just installed the operating system a few days ago in here. I didn't have all the astronomical data. Well, through DXS and Get Hot New Stuff, I was able to grab all of this information that is available for free for personal use, but we can't redistribute it, right? So we give the user the ability to actually grab uh, all sorts of astronomical data. And it's simply a, a click to install. I've installed them all, so now it says uninstall. I could click again and I uninstall it. This removes from the user the need to know where to go, how to download the data, where to put it on disk, and then how to get their applications to use it. We've taken this technology to freedesktop.org as well. This is not a KDE technology, per se. We're using it, but it's something that any of the, uh, the free software world, or the proprietary world for that matter, could, could use. And this, we have both the server component as well as the desktop component. This is one of my favorite topics. Social semantics. What the heck is that? And why is it called Nipomuk? I don't know. It's a goddess of culture. Knowledge. There we go. Now I know. See, this is, this is what participation is all about. This is a, uh, an European Union funded project. It's one of our research projects. We have a few of them going on in KDE. And the goal with this is to take desktop search and make it actually useful for everyone. Desktop search is a great idea, right? It kind of brings Google to your desktop, right? It allows you to go through and search your files. The shortcoming of these technologies is twofold. Number one, you have a search app. And it turns out users don't want a search application. They want all their applications to be able to search. So we need to be able to put this technology in all of our programs. Second of all, people wanted the, the information organized in a way that we think. Now, the computer may think it's really cool to be able to find the word giraffe in all 500 documents. And it's happy with that. I can find that word all over the place. As human beings, though, we like to say, I want the giraffe picture that was sent to me by email by John Terpstra here. He sends me giraffes all the time. I don't know what that's about, but OK. <laughs> Being able to tie contact information, the provenance of the information, or where it came from, together with the metadata is what Nipomuk is all about. And then we put this in all of our applications. Now, Nipomuk is a brand new technology. It's a research technology. You're not going to find this anywhere else. We're really taking the, the technologies that were tried and tested on the semantic web, and we're bringing them into your desktop. We use the RDF. We have a, a defined ontology that you build upon. If you're an RDF uh, uh, enthusiast, you'll hear some of the, uh, those, those uh, buzzwords. Um, so we, we have a system indexer that we use. We default to one called Strigi. And Nipomuk cooperates with Strigi to store its data and retrieve it, making it very quick to access your information. Now, RDF stores things in a graph. The graphs are hard to traverse and, 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 uh, and search. So we store that information in Strigi. Strigi can index it, tie it into our metadata, so your ID3 tags and your MP3s, um, the who created that document, if it's a, if it's a uh, office uh, word processing document, for instance. And it ties it all together. And then you can actually do these searches, and it pulls this information. And then you can start to traverse the graph from there. So I can see what other animal pictures John sent me recently. Because it's so new, we didn't have the chance to add it to a lot of our applications. But we're going to see it in a little bit when I start demoing the, uh, the desktop software. Uh, exactly, well, we see one example of, uh, of Nipomuk in action. And it's really cool because you won't, no one, when we show them this application, 
people don't even realize that they're using search and tagging and RDF clouds. It's, it's seamless uh, and it was right within the application. For the software developers, how many people here have, have uh, developed a multi-threaded application? How many people thought it was the easiest, most fun thing you'd ever done? Why'd all the hands go down? Oh, one person, okay. So if you need a multi-threaded app, go see that guy. <clears throat> Apparently he likes it. Well, again, we looked at that and went, multi-threading is very important. Multi-core systems are increasingly common. This laptop I have here has got two cores in it. Remember thinking back in the day, wow, you know, one day wouldn't it be neat if we had these machines you could pack around with you? They'd be small, light enough to, you know, just take everywhere with you, and they'd have like more than one CPU. Woo. Here we have it, right? The future's caught up with us, but our software, again, hadn't really kept pace. One of the reasons is because writing multi-threaded software is non-trivial, right? Just like the hardware issue, just like the, the multimedia issue, and it was impeding our ability to follow through on the performance and promise parts of our goals. So we took under our wing a project that already existed that was doing quite well called Threadweaver. It provides very easy access to the worker thread model. You essentially create objects you're going to put in the thread, you can schedule the threads, you can say don't start you know, this thread before you start that other thread, so you have dependencies. It makes it very simple and handles virtually all of the, the locking and whatnot for you. You can also set up a thread pool, so you can say I want you know, four threads. Now that's really cool when you hook it up to, again, something like Solid. So I can ask Solid, how many cores do I have? I've got four. Great. Let's start up a whole bunch of threads. Right? So we can actually take advantage of the hardware that it's running on at the time it's running. Again, these frameworks are going to intersect in the coming years in ways we can only imagine. Qt Concurrent is a, and I put that up there on the slide, this is something that's, that's coming with Qt 4 now, and it adds even more features for those of you who are doing multi-threading. One of the problems with multi-threading, of course, is that it's often uh, specific to the platform you're writing it on. So running a multi-threaded app on Windows might be a bit different than running it on Linux, or writing it on Linux. Um, these technologies, again, abstract away all the platform issues, so you don't have to worry about the differences. You get a very nice API that looks like all the other APIs you're used to when you're developing with KDE or Qt. So we've got all these frameworks, and that may sound like a lot of stuff we've done. What's really bizarre is that that's only a part of what we've done. That wasn't good enough for us. So back in that slide where I had all the boxes, we had the KDE platform. Um, I mentioned that Qt overlaps it. I forgot to mention this when we were talking about Phonon. Uh, Phonon was a technology developed within the KDE project in the open in the free software world. And Trolltech has adopted it as their multimedia platform as well in Qt 4.4 and beyond. So it shows how there's a symbiotic relationship between all the players in this, in this ecosystem. They didn't have to recreate their own multimedia system and have yet another API that everyone had to learn and use. We're actually sharing this API, and Trolltech actually works on it directly within KDE's uh, revision control repository, or SVN repository. I think this really shows the power of the model, where we get this great set of libraries in the form of Qt, and all these paid developers to work on that, and Trolltech also gets software in return as well that happens to meet their needs. Uh, I think that with KD4, we've really shown how well uh, free software projects that are working in the open can also cooperate with business interests. So the workspace. How's our frameworks? What are we going to do with it? Well, one of the things we noticed with other operating systems, and, and Linux as well, was people wanted to do really cool window management stuff. They wanted windows that wobbled or were transparent or translucent or did neat little effects when you hid them. And this has been available on Linux for a while now. Um, Comp is barrel, if you're familiar with that. Of course, on OS X, on Windows. Uh, we wanted to provide that, and so we put this, this support directly within our window manager. And I've got a little demo video here to show you some of the features and functionality in our compositing window manager that you get when you run the KDE workspace. Yeah, 
Something really cool that's happening right there is he's typing in, and as he types, it actually matches the window title. So you keyboard fanatics, some of these GUI effects actually do have a benefit for us too. You may have noticed that some of those effects were more useful than others. <laughs> but what's really interesting, we talked about accessibility, making our software available to all people. A lot of those features you saw in that video are absolutely critical to people with vision issues. You saw the free zoom, and actually it zooms in and you don't get these big pixel blocks. You actually get the a zoom as if you're using an actual magnifying lens. This is very important for, for those, for those uh, individuals who uh, deal with, uh, with uh, ocular issues. So it's not all just prettiness. So I'm going to take you on a brief tour here of some of our workspace applications. We have a new run dialog here that actually ties into the search and metadata. So you can type in a keyword. It will actually search through your, uh, through your system and pull things up. It also will do things such as uh, has an embedded calculator, so you can do equals and some numbers. And what's neat is it's plug-in based, so we can actually extend it um, and add new types of, of, uh, of matching uh, uh, runners. One of the ones that is being worked on right now is the ability to teach it new things. So you type in a word or a phrase it doesn't know, you select that action, and it'll actually go, so what do you actually want me to do next time you type that in? And you can actually teach your system how to respond. It's kind of like having a dog, right? So this is our new file manager. We, we shipped Conqueror for many years in KD3 and 2, and it works very well. It's an amazing power tool. Not everybody wants a power tool. They don't want a big file browser that does everything. I personally love Conqueror. I'm sure many people here in this audience do as well. But for a different audience of people who want just a file manager, a simple way to get around their file system and whatnot, we brought in Dolphin. Now, I love showing Dolphin because it, it demonstrates so many 
of the qualities of KD4. Number one, you can see a lot of the oxygen artwork that is new. We paid a lot of attention to usability. So we have a breadcrumb that we find that most uh, people find uh, easier to actually use to navigate around. And you can do things such as click on one of the buttons and go somewhere else. It really helps abstract away the concept of you're dealing with a file system. Of course, you can still click on it, get your traditional UI. We still have network transparency. Let's see if I can connect to home here. And what's cool is when you go back to, the, yeah, there we are. This is my, uh, one of my servers back in Calgary. And when you actually go back to the, uh, the breadcrumb, you can still pick your protocols and your host name. We've really tried to, to keep our focus and our emphasis on the powers of KDE while making it more accessible uh, and, and approachable for people. Now, one of the things we loved is uh, animation to provide hints. The human mind has come to be adapted to a world full of motion. And as you can imagine, it's pretty useful to be able to tell when something's coming at you with big, sharp teeth. There was a time when that happened to us a lot. And so our brains got very good at detecting motion. And over time, we've come to rely on motion cues to tell us when things are happening. We don't even think about it. It's just part of how our brain works. So we've spent a lot of time providing these kind of natural transitions and natural effects in KD4.0, and we're going to see more and more and more of them as time goes on. So if you notice, when I'm, I'm going to clear the, uh, the, the bar here, and I want you to pay attention to the clear text button that's embedded right in here. As you notice, it, it doesn't just disappear and up here, it actually fades nicely in and out. Can you see that on the, uh, some, yeah, you can, good. Some, some uh, uh, projectors don't have a refresh rate fast enough to see it. It's a very subtle effect, but the difference between something that just appears and disappears, something that fades in and out, makes all the difference in the world. It also allows us to do things like get rid of configuration options. We love the configurability of our desktop because it allows us to use the software the way we want to. Right? That's part of the freedom of free software is you get to decide how you want your software to work. The problem with that is it often results in these configuration dialogues that are full of 18,000 checkboxes. So in, in KD3, it would not be uncommon to see a sidebar like this and then decide the way to deal with it, uh, change the icons or whatnot, is to right-click on it, give them a little set of options they can click through. Great for power users, not so good for the average user. So instead, we thought, well, what have, what, why can we just allow people to freely resize it and the icons can adapt to that size. And if you notice, they don't just jump around, they actually animate up and down as well, giving a very nice effect. You'll see animations in our, in our previews, in our thumbnails, over here in our information bar, as I change between different size objects, which I need to find one. And they're all the same size for me today. Great. Oops. Oh, that's because I'm on a remote system. Let me go back to my home directory. There we go. And as you can see, it's not working for me today now. Great. Um, the, uh, the icons actually do animate between the, the, uh, the different uh, sizes. And on the sidebar, of course, you can drag and drop. We've paid a lot of attention to these kind of little issues. Now, over on this side, you'll see that I can rate a file. I can add a comment to it. I can tag it. Very, sim you know, very familiar to anyone who's used Flickr, for instance. This is using Nepomuk. So anything I do in this little sidebar here to tag or rate or add notes to it gets stored in an application-neutral storage system, Strigi and Nepomuk so that I can access that same information from any other Nepomuk-enabled application. This allows one to tag an MP3 in the file manager, and then when they're running Amarok, see those same tags and be able to build playlists, for instance, on them, or use those tags to send them onto your, onto your iPod. And that's what I meant by being embedded, right? We don't have a separate search app, per se. You, we do have an interface for it. But we're, we're putting these features directly within our applications where people would expect to find them if, they're, if you ask them, so where would you go and tag a file? Oh, the file manager. I'd open it up, go to the, the folder, and tag it. So that's where we put it. And Nepomuk gives us the ability to do this. What's also really cool is with Strigi, we worked with freedesktop.org to come up with something called Zsim, 
We love strange names. Um, ZSIM is a standardized querying system so that we can replace Strigi with Beagle or vice versa. If you're using Beagle, you can replace it with Strigi, and any ZSIM enabled uh, app, uh, application can query that back end. So we're not building, hard, we're not uh, hard coding support for specific uh, engines. So that's our new, our new file manager. We also have a new uh, uh, control uh, panel called System Settings. Um, we've done a lot of work on Conqueror. Um, we have our help browser, of course. And then we have our new desktop shell, Plasma, which unifies the panels, the taskbars, with widgets on the desktop. It provides us with a resolution independent uh, default interface. What this allows us to do is take these same items and put them on even very small systems or larger systems, say on a TV, if we're going to uh, make it part of a media center, or uh, if we have our little handhelds, there's a fellow work, walking around with the triple E PC, a very cool little uh, piece of hardware um, based on an Intel uh, design that has KDE on it, and they're selling millions of them, literally. The problem with that is they had to design a UI for it that fit nicely in their small little screen they had. With Plasma, we are able to provide or do a lot of the work on the desktop and laptops where developers live and then reuse vast amounts of that work for a different form factor or devices with different form factors. The scripting, we also provide scripting support so you can write uh, applications or widgets in JavaScript. With 4.1, we'll be bringing in the uh, Qt WebKit, which is the reporting of the HTML that became WebKit, used at Apple pervasively on the iPhone and Safari, um, bring it back. With WebKit, we can actually display HTML, CSS in these little widgets right on the desktop. And with KDE 4.1, uh, it gives us the ability to do things like load Apple dashboard widgets directly onto Plasma. And if you notice, we've actually freed everything up. So we've got the t I've got a taskbar actually on my desktop. And if people are wondering what, what use is that, because I can't, I can't ever see my desktop, because it sits in the background, well, we give you the ability to bring your desktop in front of your windows so that I can actually get to that taskbar, go back to my presentation, and it brings me right no oh, brings me right back to it. Where is it? It was here somewhere. I think I've hidden it. That's not good. There we are. So with Plasma we get this ability to provide pervasive widgets written in scripting languages that are resolution independent. We can make them smaller or bigger. And it, provides, it gives us the tools, although we provided in 4.0, a traditional desktop with a taskbar and a, a start menu that you, know, you can search. Again, the search backends onto whatever search system you have installed. Um, we provide the traditional system. It, it, Plasma is giving us the tools to be able to re-image how we actually provide the, the, uh, the desktop. So here you see this, the, you know, one very early start of that, which is Twitter on your desktop. I use it all the time now. I never really used Twitter before because I had to fire up a web browser. Well, now it's on my desktop. It's a control F12 away. It pops in front of my windows. I type in it or see what Rufy's doing, for instance. <clears throat> um, this gives us a very easy way, a very short path between online services um, and the desktop, or your media center, or your handheld device. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. And I talked about you know, promise earlier. We weren't just thinking about 4.0. We were thinking about what can, where can we go in five years, 10 years, maybe beyond that. So we're going to talk a bit about roadmap issues. Where are we going from here? Right? We've got all these frameworks. We've got this, this, uh, desktop, that st this desktop shell that started up. Where are we going? Oh, I'd like to share with you what our roadmap is. At the end of January this month, we'll be, rele we'll be tagging for release 4.0.1. We'll be releasing a minor release every month. We haven't forgotten about 3.5 because we have a lot of users with very large installations, and they don't change their, their, their installations very often, right? Every five years, seven years, some of them. So in, in uh, February, we are tagging for release 3.5.9.
and that will come out with uh, a new enterprise version of our of contact. And then in July, we'll get 4.1.0. And then we'll start releasing 4.1.1 every month, 4.1.2, 4.1.3, etc. So we're moving back now to our uh, release schedule, a little bit of release discipline. It was, it was fun the last two and a half years of being able to develop a feature-based release and go crazy and do all these you know, uh, interesting and innovative things. But now we've got the, uh, the foundations laid, our pillars are in place, our applications are coming together, and now we're focusing on regular releases with noticeable improvement in polish and feature completion, uh, completeness uh, as we go. But here's what I think is the real, could be one of the real game changers. Traditionally, we have done very well on Linux and the BSDs because most of our developers run Linux or BSD. Solaris is an operating system that we are purposefully targeting with KDE 4. KDE 3 ran nicely on Solaris, but there wasn't a lot of integration. There wasn't a lot of, uh, of, of support from the Solaris community itself. So we've actually started an open Solaris project, a project within the open Solaris community to actually manage the packaging and the, and the Solaris-specific patches and improvements to KDE 4. Now, if that wasn't cool enough that we had you know, Solaris, the BSDs, and Linux, well, we came to realization one day that for every one of us programming on the free operating systems, there were hundreds on Windows and Mac. And we were losing an opportunity here bringing free software to all of these individuals and giving them the same kind of really great tools to create software that we had. And so, in one sense, Windows and Mac had for a long time been kind of a free software ghetto. You just didn't really have it because you didn't have access to all the stuff that we were developing on Linux and BSD. All of our frameworks, as you noticed, abstract away the platform-specific details, like Solid and Phonon. And so it happened that with KDE 4, we worked on ports to Windows and Mac OS. Now, this isn't just a Linux compatibility layer or something that we lay on top of it and it looks completely foreign. You have to run an X server on your Mac OS 10 desktop or anything like that. These are native applications. They run natively. So they build just like any other Mac application or any other Windows app. These are in technology preview right now. They work. They build. In fact, we're going to see in just a few moments here. Where's Ben? Come on up. We're going to start to see, we're going to do some quick tours and walkthroughs of the of the support on Windows and Mac, so you actually get to see firsthand. I have to swap this out. So we will get to see firsthand uh, what this looks like, and the goal is to deliver these in uh, a production quality for 4.1. Now, as you may have imagined, porting to these new architectures was slightly more complex and different than, say, porting to Solaris. <laughs> these are slightly different. They, these operating systems have slightly different semantics and, and, and different uh, uh, backends that we had to support. So I'd like to introduce Benjamin Reed. He is our uh, lead KDE Mac developer. He helps uh, herd those cats. And he's going to take over and uh, show us uh, KDE on Macintosh. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start out by uh, thanking the KDE developer community in general for embracing the new technologies in Qt4 and the new build system and everything else that made things so much easier for us on other platforms. Uh, CMake has been a godsend. Qt4 has really made things a lot easier. And the transition uh, was, was much, you know, much more amazing than I thought it would be. There were a lot of times where things just worked that I thought we'd have to spend a lot of time making work. So that was, that was very cool. Um, right now, KDE on Mac actually, in most cases, is running pretty well. Uh, there's a lot of things that work right out of the box. You could go check out KDE uh, CVS, or Subversion right now and build and have a working application. Um, there's a lot of stuff that went into that. There was a lot of development that uh, the Windows folks worked on, that I worked on, that really made it possible. But uh, in the end, a lot of the work happened in the community, and it was just a, it was an amazing thing to see how much um, things really worked out with the new APIs that just made it all happen. So um, I'm going to show a few apps here. This is Conqueror. 
our uh, venerable browser actually running on Mac OS. And uh, it's uh, working pretty well. I can go to a bookmark in theory. And it does have all the support, KIO support, that everything else does. So you can do HTTP and HTTPS and FISH and all those funny protocols that let you do wacky stuff. And it seems to be taking its time, of course, since it's a demo. Um, also, KSTARS, always good eye candy. Um, KSTARS was not in any way written with the Mac in mind, as far as I'm aware, but it actually looks wonderful as a Mac app. Um, it's one of the first things I always show off when I'm showing people uh, KDE on the Mac. Um, also, an app that was originally developed with uh, the Mac in mind, it has a standalone Qt version, is Marble. It's also integrated into the KDE build, and uh, it looks wonderful as well. And if you look, everything looks like it should. All the menu bars end up on the Mac menu bar. These are native apps. They're not running under X11 or anything. I don't have the X server running. Oh, hey, my page says that it loaded. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's really quite amazing to see how things have come together. And the goal is, by KDE 4.1, to really have things well integrated, to have you know, a real, real finished release. Um, but if you want to try it right now, binaries are available. Everything that I'm showing is from a build that I did last week that you can download off of the website that is not loading in my demo. Ah, there it is. Uh, ranger.users.thinkproject.org slash KDE. Um, the binaries are universal binaries, so they run on PowerPC and Intel natively. Um, they're huge because they are universal binaries. So uh, the everything file, they're all available through Torrent so that uh, it's not destroying anyone's web server. The everything uh, installation package, which is all of KDE 4 plus uh, KOffice, weighs in at about a gig. So, <laughs> but uh, that's it. Thank you. So much. Thank you. So, as Ben pointed out, it was amazing to see how easy the software was to port over. Um, and we really look forward to welcoming the KDE community or the Mac community into the KDE community and vice versa and seeing more people that are using the Mac OS and all of its wonderful features and whatnot can actually engage with uh, our applications, use them, because we've got some pretty good stuff too. So I think the synergy is, is great. I actually had a pleasant surprise recently. I was in our IRC channel, which is KDE Darwin, if, if developers want to check it out. Um, I was working on some stuff, and someone had said, oh, yeah, I've been doing my K-Office development on Mac. And I didn't realize that, you know, that anyone had really been using it <laughs> in, in earnest. I mostly uh, I do builds, and I try things out, and I play with the guts. But you know, I, I'm, I, uh, I only occasionally use the apps in the real world as I'm still getting things you know, working and all that kind of stuff. So it was really neat to see that there are people out in the community already able to use it and use it for development and just you know, do their own thing with it. It's Reaching really out to the developers. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. So reaching out to developers was one of the things we really wanted to achieve. One of the other things we really wanted to achieve was to help the adoption and spread of open standards and open document formats. This is key and critical to maintaining freedoms around the world, actually. If we can't access our data, we can't access our information, if our government can't share information with its citizenry, if we lose our information into a digital black hole because in 10 years' time nothing can read that file format, we have issues, we have problems. Groupware is an interesting example of this problem in action. Uh, a lot of people use Microsoft Windows on the desktop, you may have noticed. What is the most common, pervasive, and perhaps even the best groupware application on the Windows platform up till now? Anybody? What's that? Office. Yeah, Office, which comes with Outlook. So Outlook gives people access to their calendaring and mail. It's interesting. <coughs> Outlook only works really well with Exchange Server. You can support other servers. I've done it using Outlook. But you start losing features. It's not so slick. You get, you know, it just doesn't look great. Interestingly enough, Microsoft isn't overly eager to change that situation. 
And so, unfortunately, when you choose a Windows desktop, oftentimes people feel that their only real choice is to use an Exchange server on the back end. You lose the freedom to choose your technologies. You choose a technology over here, and it forces your hand over there. So what if we brought a group or a suite that would be familiar enough to people that were used to Outlook and whatnot, but what ran not just on Linux and Unix, not just on Windows, not just on Mac, but on all the platforms that looked identical on all the platforms, worked identically to all the, on all the platforms, and gave equal time to any group or server that is supported. Well, suddenly, you can have a heterogeneous environment where you have Windows machines, Mac machines, Linux machines, Open Solaris machines, BSD machines, people using it on the desktop. Your support team only has to support one application. Those of you who have supported Outlook on Mac and Windows, for instance, you'll notice that they're not quite the same app. Contact is. So now you can, you can harmonize your support staff on this one application. Same features, same bugs, right? Across all the platforms. Hopefully more features than bugs. <laughs> but you also then get to choose which groupware suite you use on the server. And you may be surprised to find out, but Exchange does not use a lot of open protocols. A lot of it's fairly proprietary. For those who would like to actually be able to access their information using open protocols and open formats, you now have the option to pick your server and your desktop, and they're not tied together at the hip. I think this is one of the very exciting uh, possibilities that we're opening up by bringing our software, both groupware software as well as office software, which we support the ODF, the open document format, as our native uh, file format. We bring these applications to these other platforms. It opens up new possibilities. And with that, I'd like to introduce one of the, uh, the Windows, the KDE Windows developers. Holger, I'm not going to say your last name because I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> you can say it. I am Holger Schröder. There you go. I can't do the R thing. Um, <laughs> Holger is uh, one of our, our uh, KDE Win developers, and he's going to demo for us uh, KDE on Windows. Yes, I do. So, <clears throat> okay, so we start with K stars. The, in <laughs> the interesting thing on this computer is right now I did not develop any things on this computer right now by myself. I just installed the packages which are downloadable from our servers. I will show them, show the servers in the end. And well, this is KSTARS. I am not really used to using it. But it kind of works. We also have marble. I'm a lot more used to the earth. So you can zoom in, find Berlin. <coughs> and of course, for Windows users, we need um, games. It's not on there. Anyway. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> So you can become MCSE with this thing. <laughs> <coughs> well, we also have Conqueror basically running. And for all us KDE on Windows users, we are quite used to, well, using Google like this. And it works. So it feels a lot more familiar right now. OK, something else to show. We do not yet have KOffice running. We are working on that. We do not yet have Conqueror running. We are working on that. But besides that, it's quite usable right now. And we try to aim at being really stable at 
KDE 4.1. Um, yeah, I want to show how to get to install KDE on Windows. You go to windows.kde.arg. <coughs> um, there you find a link to download our installer. It's some megabytes, so I didn't download it right now. It looks like this. The interesting thing about this installer, it's, it's a Qt binary, which you install on computers once. And then it downloads a description of how to install which programs over the internet. So we are not distributing some kind of packaged self-extracting Excel files once, and then we leave the user alone. With this, we enable the opportunity to update things they installed once. And also, when we have, <coughs> for example, KOffice running in, I don't know, some months, the additional applications which will be available then will show up in this installation program. So for example, if we want to install KDE somewhere, we simply mark the things we want to have, then say download, and it shows additional dependencies. And then it starts downloading. So it's basically usable for normal end users. And well, that's about it. What I think is remarkable is, again, you saw K-Stars, Marble, Conqueror on all these platforms. And there's not a lick of platform-specific code in any of those applications. Right? This all happens in the framework layers. So as application developers, you can write one code base. You can develop it on Windows, if you wish. And you're not locking yourself out of the growing Linux community or the growing Mac OS community, or vice versa. If you prefer to develop on a free operating system, free software operating system like Linux or BSD Open Solaris, you're not giving up the Windows community. Or if you want to develop on Mac, you're not giving up the Linux community. or the Windows. So we're bringing all these communities together of, of users, um, which really opens up the door. Um, and it's, it's been fascinating to actually watch it unfold and happen and how, really how easily yeah, it's come it's, together. It's so amazing. We are only about like five to ten people working on the Windows stuff in part time, and we kind of made it till now. So I'm quite amazed about that. <laughs> and when he talks about being amazed at it, he realized that they haven't done K-Office yet, but they've done the rest of KDE. That's like 4 million and change lines of code. We're not talking about porting you know, a 10,000 or 100,000 line application. We're talking libraries, app, uh, whole suites of applications. It's really rather impressive. So when 4.1 4 comes out, as I mentioned, July, that is our goal to actually produce uh, production-ready releases. But don't let that scare you off, because in technology preview, as you saw, they already work rather well. Oh, and don't worry, you don't actually have to run the, the uh, KD apps from the command line in Windows. You can always spot the, uh, the, 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 the ex-Linux geek when he pops up the console and starts using it, right? Um, but you can actually you know, put, desk, uh, put the icon on your desktop, or it appears in the Start menu, and you can launch it directly like you would any other Windows app. Uh, I think what is also really interesting is that the widgets, as you saw, they didn't stand out as, oh, that's a Linux app, right? or that's a Windows app on Linux. So there's been some porting efforts, quote unquote, for some applications to Linux, for instance, and it, it looks like a Windows app that's running in a, on a Linux machine. And this, again, destroys that barrier. So we're really opening up the, uh, the accessibility of technology to more and more people. So here's uh, K-Stars again on Linux, just so you can, now you've seen on the other two platforms, and we saw it quite a while ago, it's the exact same application. K-Pat. Now K-Pat's quite, quite interesting. I mean, everyone needs Solitaire, right? So you have to have that, otherwise you can't be installed in an office, apparently. Now, as you notice, there's these really nice smooth animations, things switching and turning. And what's neat is if I change the size of the, uh, the game, it actually re-renders, and you don't get pixely bit maps and whatnot. 
how do we achieve this? Well, part of the beauty thing, again, was we've pervasively used SVG, which is an open standard format for vector graphics. SVG actually has a lot of capabilities, um, some of which you're seeing here. All of our games have been retooled to use SVG so that they can be themed easily and resized to any size. What's really neat is you can now play KPAT on devices that have really tiny screens. If I can, uh, there you go. I can't see it anymore, <laughs> but it's there. And it is, of course, actually playable. And if I was on a phone, that might make more sense. So we're taking these concepts across the board to, with our applications. Um, Q, uh, Trolltech recently released a Windows CE port of their, of their library. And it's amazing when you take these desktop-style applications to these different devices, how well the UI adapts if it's written with resolution independence in mind. If it's written to actually have a humane interface on it um, instead of a highly instrumented with 18 million toolbars everywhere. And of course, here we have Marble as well. Marble is really interesting because it's a component. It is an application, but with one line of code, you too and your application can have a spinning 3D world. It doesn't rely on OpenGL, which is really impressive in my mind. Um, a lot of math going on in the background. And of course, you can provide different overlays. This might not be the place to be talking about street level mapping, <laughs> but <clears throat> all the Google people, turn off your ears. No, uh, there's work started underway uh, with, with uh, Marble. It is freely zoomable, as you saw on the other platforms. It also works on Linux, of course. If you zoom in right now, you'll notice we don't have street data. We're working with a project, or starting to work with a project called OpenStreetMap, which is all about freeing up map resource information. It's interesting, maps are highly proprietary. Um, usually that's fine and OK. I love Google Earth. It's actually written with Qt, by the way, which is why it's so easily portable across the platforms. Um, I use maps.google.com all the time. That's great. Those are great tools. But I can't actually interact with that data in a, in a way that gives me the freedom that I'm used to uh, in dealing with this sort of data. So instead of trying to free up someone else's data, what the OpenStreetMap people did, bizarrely, crazy, most of these ideas start with crazy thoughts and, and ideas, right? Um, was they said, well, why don't we just get people to go walk around the world with GPS devices? We'll record where they go, and then we'll upload all the GPS trails into a server. Then we'll have other people that will go on, download the GPS trails, and then mark them up so that they can label what the streets are. And, and then we'll have street maps. You got to wonder how many beers they were having that night. <laughs> but great things start with great optimism. Great things start with audacious vision. And so we will have, eventually, street maps where the data is open, where the application that you access it is also open, and you'll be able to zoom in and see your street level mapping. Um, Marble itself already does tile-based rendering. Um, you won't see it in, in 4.0 because it's well hidden inside the guts of the code, but we can actually deliver tiles over the network from a server and uh, do the tiled rendering that we all have come to, to know and love um, in proprietary mapping applications. There'll still be room for proprietary applications, of course, because they'll have features and functionality that we probably just won't, uh, won't provide. But this is focusing on, on people that really should have um, access to this information. And just like with ODF, which is being uh, it's the open document format, which is the ISO standard format for word processing, spreadsheet, and uh, documents presentation software. It's being adopted by more and more countries, ODF is. You'll find it, uh, countries in Europe have started to give it the rubber stamp approval so that all their, uh, their, their files must be stored in ODF format. Um, places in Africa, um, I hope to see more of it happen in North America. It started, it was tried um, out in the great state of Massachusetts and it didn't quite get through. We saw some, uh, some pushback on that. But just as with ODF, the adoption is growing. With OpenStreetMaps, we've uh, had situations, I believe it was the Netherlands, that donated. Uh, they, the government had paid for street-level maps for the entire country. And when they found out about OpenStreetMap, they said, yeah, that's a great idea, and donated the entire set of data. Um, another country that did vast portions of India has also donated their data. Uh, the United States, they're right now in the process of, of importing uh, U.S. government collated 
information, street level information, because of course you need it for Census Bureau, right? You need to know what streets to send your people to go ask for a census. That information is right now, as we speak, being crunched um, on the servers. It's a fairly big data set, so it's taking them months to actually rip through it, but at that point we'll have street level maps for, uh, for the United States. And it was funny, when I first heard about this project, I thought, ah, well, I'm from Calgary, Canada, so I thought, I wonder if they have, nah, they won't have street maps, and my entire city's done. It's, it was amazing. This little guy here, just kind of a closing feature that I, I really love, um, it's like any other desktop widget that we, we uh, support. You can rotate it freely. Put the kitty upside down if you want. You can resize it and re-renders. It's an SVG. What you're looking at here is four lines of JavaScript. Provide a little package, a little JavaScript file. I dragged it from my add widgets dialog onto my desktop. And without the application really knowing what was going on, it was suddenly running a little bit of JavaScript um, on my desktop. Just like with Cross, we have the ability to provide multiple languages. And we will eventually be providing support for Python, Ruby, and well, whatever else anybody feels the, uh, the urge to, to supply. So, I hope that I've been successful in kind of giving you a taste of where we are right now with KDE 4, with the 4.0 release, and more importantly, where we're going. I mentioned earlier that you know we've got years ahead of us of releases, and we do. This uh, platform has been designed and built to last well into the next decade. We'll see just how far we can take and how many cool things we can do. But I think we've built a foundation that will survive and will allow us to do things that just haven't been seen in computing before, at least on desktop computing. Taking things out of the research labs, such as Nipomoc, and bring it onto production desktop systems. And this is interesting, because it wasn't so many years ago that we were chasing taillights. Right now, in that, that jostle on the freeway, we've actually overtaken and we're passing our competition when it comes to technology. I'm really excited about this, uh, and more than anything else, I'm very proud to be part of a community that is as vibrant, literally thousands strong, as I said at the beginning, as vibrant, as welcoming, as open, and as unbelievably talented and intelligent as the KDE people.